Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Flower, back with another East Tennessee Fishing Report with Ellis Ward. How you doing, Ellis? I am doing well, Marv. How are you? As always, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble, and uh, you may not be getting much rain, but you're definitely cooling off here in the near future. Yeah, next week is looking, I see 20s on two different days, so it's November all of a sudden. I think that's the tender cast, but yeah, it's it's going to be chilly. But we got uh, one last little week of the upper 70s is the highs. So trend, to the transition will be somewhat complete to to fully autumn, if not late autumn. Yeah. And how how long does it have to be kind of cold like that before it kind of messes up your rodent bite? Oh, uh, well... That's an interesting question, and that the the answer to that is effectively which who's who is fishing. So the rodent bite is going to be based on whether or not we're putting rodents onto the water, not whether or not we have rodents out and about. So one of the unique parts about the tailwater is that unlike a lot of the free stones and spring creeks and a lot of places where mousing is made famous, I'm I'm thinking of Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania. Those are iced out, and if if they're not minimal flows and um, or, you know, or or muddy, and and also just those areas, it's you're, you're looking at 10, 15 degree days as the norm. So with the tailwaters here and, and the relatively temperate climate, where we're looking at, you know, upper 30s, mid 40s as kind of our average run rate winter day, our banks are green 365 days a year, and mice don't hibernate. Uh, that's that's why you start hearing little scratches on in your shed or hopefully not in your kitchen cabinets come this time of year when it starts getting cold they need to find somewhere where they're safe for the winter and if they're still out in the fields uh they have fresh water and there is food right next to the river and it starts to become limited their their food supplies and their water supplies those start to become limited, not near the river. So the the, the notion that um, winter might slow things down, it's, it really starts to fall on its face uh, on just about every facet, in, including the fact that mice are, are mammals. So the colder it gets, the more calories they need in order to keep their body temperature at a a healthy temp so all that you know the the nocturnal stuff does not stop throughout the winter it's just do you want to go out and do that when it's kind of windy and you know below a 28 yeah maybe we focus on daylight fishing (laughs) fair enough and so you know i would imagine uh since i was out with you the streamer bite's just been getting better right yeah, that's another one that, you know, throughout this period of time, it it, it changes, and it changes mostly on a day-to-day basis because of ambient conditions, you know, inter and intraday. So be- between day-to-day, are we getting any influence from the tributaries? Is it colored up at all? Those are good things. Um, is there cloud cover? That's another big one. Are we getting water? Is the generation? That's another big one. Just did you know the the lower South Holston and low water, which is it, that's about as tough as you can get. And you know we get, we got a nice fish. Um, pretty high afternoon sun, bluebird day, gin clear water, but it takes work. And you're really I'm I'm back rowing through. 80% of the float and we're hitting the hot spots because otherwise it's just you can see everything that you're coming up on and everything can see you. 
So the the streamer bike kind of I, I I tend to start shifting away from the trout streams as as much you now. My focus starts going towards musky in the next month or two, and you know there, there's a lot of big fish moving up into the the middle river, and and we can still fish streamers on on generation, but it's just it, it's kind of a it provides a good excuse to to shift more of my time and energy toward the muskie and, um, you know, staying off the rivers during that period of time isn't a bad idea anyways. Not that you can't fish to fish who are either pre or post spawn. You're fishing the structure. That's not a red. <laughs> You're fishing up against the bank and, and pulling them off of rock shelves and, and deep water. And yeah, I mean, I think that feedback starts to go on, I would say, as early as two months ago. And um, and then things quiet down. You know, they're, they're less concerned about eating for a good couple of weeks. And, and then, you, then you start to get into thinking about post-spawn, which I actually start thinking about. As soon as it stops. Yeah, which is a perfect segue because our boy Fleas and Meat sent you another question and wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, the best ways to kind of target post-spawn browns in terms of tactics and flies. And sounds like he's uh, a little mouse and curious as well. We should all be in, <laughs> in, the, perfect, in the perfect world. I, I got a trip tomorrow and it's South Holston's not run until 12. It's like, yeah, you know, we'll push till dark and then maybe, I don't know, I feel like I'm convincing people against their will. Well, it's a mess for an hour or two. Um, yeah, post-spawn browns. Again, we're talking about streamer fishing and we're talking about big fish. If you have gin clear water and you have no bitey conditions around, it's going to be tough fishing. You're not nymphing for five inch fish you're you're trying to get one or two in the boat that day and some of them might be you know 14 16 18 like you're not going after two footers all the time when you're fishing post spawn rounds with streamers uh there are days though where that bitiness is a little something special and that happens all the time that could be yesterday that could be a week from now that could be in the middle of the summer so mm -hmm. you, you get the bite conditions the difference there is that there's a lot of lake run fish and there's a lot of fish redistributing throughout the system where there's different pockets of the river that have higher densities of bigger fish and so you'll see certain runs, certain sections, certain, you know, day floats that are, that are, I mean, relative to most of the year packed with big fish. And I, I would say when, when you start getting bitiness there and you're catching a couple fish on, let's say, a peanut envy or a sex dungeon, stop fishing those. See what happens when you do something, you know, go to a drunk and disorderly, go to a triple drunk. Start fishing game changers. Last year, of you know, going through this progression, I watched my good friend Jack landed personal best twenty eight giant fish. There's nothing else to do that day. I landed at twenty six that day. I started fishing musky flies and got one of the coolest eats from a you know quote unquote smaller fish, twenty one inch male trout, blowing through the surface through the stomach of a musky fly. I mean, I mean it, it's. <laughs> those are really the times to explore what you want to do in terms of your fishing and also um, what those fish are capable of because that that post spawn is really a they haven't eaten in weeks and and some of them aren't used to getting pressured they're they're heading back towards lakes um, so it's I would say it's a time to explore. Yeah, it almost reminds me a little bit of like fishing steelhead when they're dropping, whether they're either coming in or dropping out, right? And they just, they move from spot to spot to spot as they, you know, try to get to where they want to go. 
Yeah, uh, one, I would say one difference there would be that a lot of what we're talking about is even when they do redistribute in on the South Olson and the Wataga, that is, because of the fact that Boone is, and this isn't necessarily addressing his question, but Boone Lake is is dropped 30 feet, and so we're getting a couple extra miles of river that would be lake and we're talking about lake run fish moving back down into the lake so i haven't had conversations with these fish yet but i do suspect that some of them are going to be holding where they would be in the lake which is for a couple months river um i'm guessing some of them are are going to be treating the river as as a place that they're not going to hang around in and, and get more towards the lake so yeah, similar in that they're moving, and then the that that kind of cool, unique difference of you're fishing to a river that is starting to lose ground. It's starting to turn back into the lake when you get towards the the early to mid March. Yeah, got it. And so, uh, what can you give fleas and meat to uh, scratch his fall mousing edge? Man. Go, go out and chuck rodents. I mean, there's really <laughs> one, one of the, if, which is the open-ended question. I think one of the coolest parts of fall mousing is that, especially in more and higher latitudes, it's starting to get dark at 7, 7.30, and then you get hit with the fall back. You can mouse for three hours and be in bed by 10. Um, so the, you know, even if it's going to be freezing that night, go out and do it for a couple hours after after sunset and kind of a general guideline on, on mousing. If you can do it without any moon at all, that's awesome. You can look up different so lunar calendars, Farmer's Almanac, um, and and look at the moon rise and moon set. I've seen a little bit of a correlation to how active game is supposed to be based on that calendar. It it's really you want to have that moon on the other side of the earth. So if you can get out on a a night when the moon set occurs near sunset, that's awesome. Otherwise, you know, try try to get that try to get that new moon phase or close to it. Uh, well, there you go. And you know, folks, we love questions at the Articulate Fly. You can email them to us. You can DM us on social media, whatever is easiest for you. And if we use your question, I will send you some Articulate Fly swag. And we're going to enter you into a drawing for two days of fishing with Ellis and a night at the Watauga River Lodge. And Ellis, before I let you hop this evening, you want to let folks know, you know, where they can find you so they can book you and fish with you. But I bet you also maybe have a little bit of a status update on the bucktail situation too, right? Oh, I love the teaser. Yeah. Uh, Instagram is Ellis Ward Guides. Uh, best way to contact me, book trips, pick my brain about what your trip might look like, ask about bucktail, my cell phone at 513 513- Five four three zero zero one nine, and I have probably about two hundred tails out in the shed that are dried from archery season. We got uh, the young bucks are there, there's a um, I think under some sort of youth opener this weekend, and that'll probably give me a couple hundred more, and then. You know, gun season is right around the corner, and and it really starts to become um, as much as my freezer space can hold. So I'll probably start putting them out either on Flyzotics or, you know, I'll make an announcement on my Instagram page in the next week or two. Yeah, and so if someone wanted to buy you another chest freezer, how many tails would you give them? Uh, depends on what they're tying. They want changer tails. <laughs> I I would I would uh I'd be open to bartering. Yeah, fair enough. So folks, 
you know, if you have a spare freezer and you like bucktail, you might want to work something out with Ellis. Um, as I always say, fall is my favorite time of the year to get out on the water and uh, you owe it to yourself to get out there and catch a few. Tight lines, everybody. Tight lines, Ellis. Appreciate it, Marv. Thank you.